Good afternoon. My name is Heather Stewart and I Stop my video there for the, for the bandwidth. Uh, my name is Heather Stewart and I'm a geologist with the British Geological Survey and I specialise in marine geology. So um, basically if it's covered in water or and you would have to get wet to get a proper look at the rocks, then that's usually where you'll find me. And um, in 2018 and uh, 2019, I was lucky enough to be expedition geologist for the Five Deeps expedition. And so over the next sort of um, 30 minutes or so, I'm going to take you on a whistle stop tour of the deepest parts of our oceans. So I've got quite a lot to cover, um, so I'll cherry pick some highlights along the way, but please um, sit back and hopefully enjoy the, the presentation. And, um, and there's time for some questions at the, at the end, but please, um, I hope you, you find this uh, the next half hour entertaining. So the entire Five Deeps is conceived by uh, Victor Vescovo, pictured here. And he's a private equity investor from America. He's a sort of tall Texan, a retired US Navy intelligence officer and a MIT and Harvard Uni graduate. And um, he came up with the idea of Five Deeps after completing the Explorer's Grand Slam. And that's where um, individuals climb the seven highest peaks on the seven continents. And Victor was the 12th American to do that. He'd also skied to the North and South Poles and, um, and he's a, a qualified pilot and everything, you know. So after doing all of those major sort of, sort of adventuring um, endeavors, you know, he was sort of left going, well, what's next, you know? And he's quoted as saying, you know, exploring the areas that nobody has ever been to before is extremely exciting. And that's certainly something that I can, I can relate to. Um, that's, that's why I do my job at the British Geolog Geological Survey. But um, so Victor's attention had turned to the, to the oceans and, um, and so a plan sort of formulated in his head and he decided that he would like to look to be the first person to dive solo to the five deepest places on earth. So that's where the sort of concept of the five deeps came to. But I mean, there were two big challenges um, that sort of started right at the beginning. Well, do we even know where to go? Where are the deepest points in our five oceans? And do we even have a vehicle that that we could use to get us there so and those are, are two pretty major fundamental parts of the five deeps and it's certainly that first question um sort of where do we know where to go and that's where my involvement in the five deeps sort of started so i mean i think it's worth mentioning that you know the first major attempt to systematically map the world's oceans was only published in 1977 and that was a groundbreaking map. It contributed to our, our general acceptance of plate tectonics. But I mean, it revealed that the seafloor was not just some sort of flat, you know, maybe slightly undulating wasteland. Probably looked like, a bit like the Fens in Cambridge. I don't, I don't know. But um, it wasn't like that at all. Far from it. We've got major sort of networks of mid ocean ridges where continent uh, where crust is being produced. We have areas of subduction zones, so sort of these um, sort of dark linear gashes on the on the sea floor where crust is being consumed. We've got sea mounts and volcanoes and all sorts going on. And I mean this was really the first map that let us see that, see the topography of the sea floor. But it's worth realizing that you know you look at that map and you think, well, we know we know all about the seafloor now. We know where the deep places are. We know where the shallow places are. You know, what, where's the big question? What's the big deal? And I mean, sort of stepping forward to, to sort of where we are today and our understanding today, this is the Jebco World Ocean Map. Um, this is a 2019 version. They've, they have published a, an up-to-date one this year, but I mean, for the purposes of this, it hasn't changed um, much. Um, but again, you get this impression that we know everything. We know all, all about the seafloor topography and the intricate geomorphology of the seafloor. But I mean, it's worth always questioning the sources. So we need to drill down and have a look at what data has been put into making that map. You know, those continuous blues and, 
and, uh, and, and shaded relief images. Now it's worth taking on board here that everything that's sort of white and in the sort of polar regions, the sort of pale pink and the, and the blue there, all of, all of the white, the big pale, blue, pale pink and pale blue splotches, that indicates no data or data derived by sort of satellite information. All of the coloured lines and spots, that's where we've actually got a proper depth and estimate. But I mean, the, how old those de de depth estimates is important as well. I mean, this is a, a database that's been compiled over many, many years and holds records that can go back, you know, 100, 150 years in some places. So if we look at just a snapshot of what the modern sort of multi-beam data, so this is kind of the, the data that we've got most confidence in for giving us high resolution indications of the bathymetry, you know, the white areas are, are significant. I mean, there's a lot of white areas in that map. And there's a massive global effort to try and fill in those white areas just now, and I'll discuss that a little bit more later on, called Seabed 2030. So that take home message is that really 82% of our oceans and seas are unmapped. So I mean, you know, how could we confidently tell Victor where to go on his global journey to get to the five deeps? So we undertook a, a, a desk study to address that very issue. And I published that with um, my, my collaborator at Newcastle, um, Alan Jameson. And we looked at all of the best available data of, uh, that we could get our hands on to find the five deeps of the five oceans. And there's a few areas that um, I've got better, area, better data than others. You know, for example, um, in the Pacific, the Mariana Trench, that's pretty much accepted as being the deepest part of the world. And, um, and there's quite good data control. There's quite a lot of published articles all looking at how deep the Mariana Trench is. And um, whereas other areas like the Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean, the deep parts of those oceans are relatively unexplored. And the only data that's available is this coarse satellite derived data. So you have a broad impression about the shape of the seafloor, but you don't see any of the detail. So we've addressed that challenge. We've got a short list of sites of where to go. And so we can start to plan where the vessel is going to go and, and take Victor and his crew. But the next issue that, that happened was that uh, there wasn't a vehicle in existence in the world that could take Victor to the bottom of the ocean. So full ocean depth is just short of 11 kilometers deep. So we didn't have anything around that, that could get him there and back. And I think it's worth taking a little step back and a look historically at, um, at the first full ocean depth vehicle, which was the, the Trieste, which in 1960, Don Walsh and Jacques Picard became the first people to dive to the ocean floor um, on the Mariana Trench in Challenger Deep in 1960. And it was very much a sort of, um, it was straight up, uh, straight down and straight back up. They didn't have any mechanism to maneuver on the sea floor and um, to explore their surroundings. It took them, I think, five hours to go down and they spent about 20 minutes on the sea floor. Again, as I said, they couldn't move around and then they released their weights and came back up. And I think it took about three hours, 15 minutes for them to, to come back up. Um, just to sort of point, um, unfortunately, uh, Jack Picard has, has passed away. But Don Walsh is still going strong, and that's a picture of him on board the pressure drop, talking to Victor on the right. And we've got um, Patty, Patty Fryer, um, who's a, a world-renowned geologist who works for the USGS, based in Hawaii, um, in, the, in the background there. And that picture was just taken last year. Um, so since 1960, the only other person to get to the, the bottom of uh, Challenger Deep in a, in a submersible was James Cameron, the famous director. And he used, um, his vehicle was called Deep Sea Challenger. And, um, and again, you know, it, it was built for, for speed, for going up and down um, very quick. He did a number of test dives in the New Britain Trench, um, as well as, as his um, epic dive in, in the Mariana Trench. And he recorded a, a depth um, on his dive site of 10,908 metres. Um, and he observed some of the life that was down there and recorded that using, using external video cameras and the like. 
So and all that has been published scientifically in, in 2015. So apart from those two vehicles, but you know, one was, you know, it's like 50 years old um, or no, more, but um, and the other one unfortunately was lost to science and, and can no longer dive. Um, a new vehicle had to be forged and designed and, and built. And so Triton uh, submarines um, took that on. And this is a picture of the, the DSV limiting factor. And you can see the, the little bubble on the front there. That is what is exposed in this other picture in the bottom right. And that is a titanium sphere that can take two people um, to, the, to the bottom and back. It's shaped a little bit like a, a, sort, of, um, a sort of lens on the, on the sort of vertical. So it, it's very, very quick at going up and down in the water column. Um, and then you, you maneuver along the seabed using, using the external thrusters. So um, John Ramsey, who designed uh, Limiting Factor, um, lent me these, uh, these following slides. And we can see just a little cutout. And I love that it looks like a little open mouth with teeth. I think that's really, really funny. The teeth are actually the oxygen bottles. So that's your air supply. And you can see the two seats within the titanium sphere there and the thrusters on the outside. And John's kindly annotated all of these slides. Um, so on the top there, there's a number of sensors, you know, like um, there's radio and, and uh, lights for whenever you're on the sea surface waiting to get picked up. You've got sonar for using um, when you're down on the sea floor to look for obstacles ahead of you. You've got modems for communications. You've got your weights down at the bottom underneath the sphere here. So when you, you use the weights to help sort of drag you down through the water to get to the sea floor. And then once you're at the sea floor, um, you you release some of your weights so that you're neutrally buoyant, but the rest of the weights you, wait, you hold on to until the, the end of the dive, and then you jettison those, and then you, you, you head back up uh, to sea surface. You've got the batteries on either side down near the bottom of the submarine as well, and of course the, 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 the sort of titanium uh, structure on which everything is bolted. And just a slightly different view there. Um, all of the buoyancy is from syntactic foam that's sort of, sort of attached to the to the frame. And we've got a manipulator arm as well on the front for taking biological and geological samples um, and depositing those with the, the scientific landers that I'll talk about shortly. Um, you've also got a tank in the top that you sort of fill with water when you're going down and, and uh, you sort of pump that water out once you're back to sea surface and you know, it fills with air. So I mean, it's it's a really really fantastic piece of kit that's that's available to the community. I mean, it's just it's it's a really great um, merciful. Um, we've got a fleet of uh, science and navigation landers. So we've got three of these, and primarily they're for navigation for the submarine, but they've got you know a scientific payload as well. So we put as much science equipment as possible onto those landers, um, cameras, traps, um, conducti conductivity, temperature and, and salinity measurements and depth measurements, uh, water samplers. At the front there, I talked about the manipulator arm. So we've got a box for the ma manipulator arm on the submersible to place objects into. And we've got core rack there so that the manipulator arm can be actually be used to take um, sediment cores as well. And we put all of that onto a boat. Uh, this is the good ship pressure drop. Uh, she's 68 metres long, capable of uh, carrying 49 people. But I mean, primarily, especially when I think about my own research and the, and the work that I do, we kitted her out with something called a multi beam echo sounder. And that's a method by which to make really great high resolution, high definition maps of the topography of the sea floor. And that's the exact, that's the sort of thing that I use in my research. Um, and of course, there's, there's laboratory space and, and all sorts um, on board pressure drop as well. It's a really, um, really great sort of kitted out piece of uh, equipment. But I mean, so we've got all that. We've got a map of where we want to go um, in terms of geographic locations around the world. We've got the submarine, we've got the landers, we've got the boat, we're good to go. And I mean, the first place was the Puerto Rico Trench in the Atlantic Ocean. And we did that just before Christmas um, in 2018. And I mean, this, this was <laughs> thinking back on it now while I was writing the presentation. I mean, it was really quite nerve wracking. Um, it was, everybody was getting to know each other, all the different groups. I mean, the, a lot of the scientists, you know, I mean, I've worked with Alan Jameson for a long time and Alan's the, the chief scientist for the five deeps. Um, but, you know, the, 
there were and all the Triton guys knew each other. But I mean, in terms of the the dynamic between all of these groups, it was all very new. We were finding our feet, the relationships were, were developing. But what was also added into that mix was that we had a television documentary series uh, being filmed uh, about the five deeps. And if you can spot them, you know, we've got people here with cameras on the deck while we're launching one of the, the landers there. We've got them, them up on high watching Victor watching us on the deck. You know, I mean, it was, it was interesting. And as I said, we're, we're growing these relationships and, you know, it was the first deep, you know, there's still quite a lot of testing of equipment going on. You know, there were quite serious discussions and planning meetings and, and just a lot of stuff going on. There was a lot of people on board and all of that is being filmed. So all of our meetings, you know, we're all mic'd up and, and things, you know, working on the back deck, you know, it was all, it was all very uh, new, certainly, certainly to me, you know, as being somebody, uh, being a geologist, I'd never done anything like that before with that sort of level of, of sort of external scrutiny. But I mean, there were things that I loved, you know, you could be walking around the ship and you'd see a box that was labeled, you know, LF, meaning the limiting factor, the submersible, life support, install before dive, you know, and I just thought that was brilliant. You know, to me, it, it seemed a wee bit obvious, but you know, it's just, you know, I liked that belt and braces approach, you know, everything was labeled, you know, the, you know, there was a place for everything and everything in its place. And, um, and again, you know, getting to know the, the, the different groups on board, um, the officers, the crew, the, the engineers and everything. And of course, you know, we had the submersible installed on in the back deck um, yet to be used in anger for the five deeps um, in particular. So Puerto Rico, this is a, a map of the, the Puerto Rico trench and you can see it's quite narrow in the east but it opens up like a flower in the west and that sort of large sort of flat bottomed expanse in the west there where that white star is, that's where we were concentrating our new mapping effort to really pinpoint where the deepest point was. Because when we went back in the death study and we were looking at you know, historically, you know, what had been done in the Puerto Rico Trench, we find all these names of deeps, you know, like the Milwaukee Deep, the Brownson Deep, the Dolphin Deep, another Challenger Deep. And, you know, really a lot of those didn't really exist in terms of like an actual confined something that looked like a basin or, or something. So it was, it was interesting to go through this death study process to really sort of narrow down where it was that we were wanting to spend our time and our effort. And so we went out and we mapped using the brand new um, multi beam system and we found the deepest point at 8,378 metres in that sort of flat bottomed area in the western part of the, the trench. And just before Christmas, um, Victor did his very first solo dive to the bottom of, of that trench. Um, and I think, you know, again, looking back, you know, I can't get over just how much tension there was. You know, I mean, it was you know, it was the very first one, you know, we weren't sure what was going to work, what wasn't going to work, you know, it was all very exciting and the tension in the, on board the ship while Victor was in the sub and doing his dive on his way down, you know, this is in the blue boiler suit is Patrick Leahy, um, who is an incredibly experienced submersible pilot himself, but he's been building and piloting submersibles for his entire career, incredibly experienced and gifted um, uh, engineer and um, and he was you know very tense you know it was his focus was a hundred percent on the LF with Victor inside and the moment where Victor sort of radioed back to say on bottom was just it was like a wave breaking and the relief and you know it was like you know what oh, this is real we can actually do this you know we could go around the world and explore the deep parts of the, of the globe wow, this is real. It was, that was the moment in my mind, I'm sure some of the, our, um, my colleagues on board might think differently, but in my mind, that was a moment where it almost became a reality that, that we could do this. You know, that first deep, is what was, what was ri riding on that was, was a lot. And so Victor came back safely um, and, and there was a fair few pina coladas drunk that night before we all got home, uh, got off the boat and, and flew home. So that was the first deep, one down, four to go. And of course, the next one was the Southern Ocean. So um, the Southern Ocean itself has got a reputation for being slightly lumpy, as we say offshore, um, a bit rough. 
but um but we were we were hopeful i mean you know doing puerto rico really sort of put us all on on a positive there for going to to this southern ocean and we sailed from montevideo and uh, we had the opportunity to drop in on south georgia on the way which was just fantastic but i mean just to give you a flavor the southern ocean is everything that you would hope and dream it can be it can be beautiful it, we hit a number of storms coming down don't get me wrong but um but the weather in south georgia was just phenomenal and it is just like any sort of documentary series that you could imagine i mean you literally had to pinch yourself you know you'd be working on back deck and you know freezing temperatures and then you just realize that there's whales birds penguins icebergs just all over the place and it's just you know what this is this is why we do our jobs you know this, <laughs> these are the benefits of our work but to business um, as I said, the South Sandwich Trench was really unexplored. The, the data quality before we got there was incredibly poor. And, um, and as part of the death study, you know, I mean, we identified a number of points, all these white stars on this map, you know, could have been a contender for the deepest point in that trench. The other issue that we had was that, you know, depending on what expert you talk to, the definition of where the Southern Ocean starts is different. If you talk to an oceanographer, they put the Southern Ocean much, much further north, you know, as, as the start of the Southern Ocean and where the, the South Atlantic ends, in which case Meteor Deep, which was discovered in 1926 by the Germans, would be the deepest point uh, in the trench and therefore the Southern Ocean. But if you look at, you know, various uh, global treaties, you know, the International Hydrographic Office, you know, they all put the boundary of the Southern Ocean at 60 South. And so that was the boundary that we took because the, the oceanographic water mass boundary, you know, that does fluctuate seasonally. So we thought, let's take something that everybody can, can recognize it's defensible. So we'll take the, the 60 degrees South. So this area in the very South of the trench whoop, is the area of the the deepest point in the South Atlantic, uh, in the Southern Ocean even. And so we, we spent a long time mapping the length of the trench, um, which is, is just fantastic from a, a geological point of view. Um, the, the geological features that we're, we're seeing and we're identifying and we're, we're interpreting at the moment, uh, it's just fantastic. And um, we found that deepest point down here in the Southern Ocean as being 7,432 meters. And Victor dove that just before his birthday in February. But what was interesting to me is that Meteor Deep in the north, so that's um, this little box B, that is Meteor Deep, and the red spot is the, is the deepest point of Meteor Deep. You know what? We sounded that as 8,265 metres deep. The Germans in 1926 said that it was 8,264 metres deep, so they were only one metre out. So I think that's, I love that, that little fact, you know, that really, you know, they got it right in 1926. Um, but another interesting thing is that really, you know, that position in Meteor Deep is only 111 metres shallower than the Puerto Rico Trench. So it was almost, you know, the deepest point in the Atlantic. So we were almost in the situation where the deepest point in two oceans was in one large scale geological feature. So onwards, we all got off in, um, in Cape Town and the pressure drop continued across the Indian Ocean, making a stop in, uh, at the Diamantina Fracture Zone, which is located off southwest Australia, to do a survey there. And then it transited up to the Java Trench. And again, like the South Sandwich Trench, um, it was very poorly covered. And even to, the, um, even to the extent that if you look at the database of geographic names, in the marine environment, you know, they have a feature called the Java Deep. And you can see here this white, red, the, this red spot doesn't even plot within the, the trench axis. And that is kind of what they had um, as labeled as the, as the Java Deep. So one of the sort of side projects that we've got coming out of the five deeps is, is actually to, to try and, you know, rectify some of these, these little disparities, you know, because some of these positions are based on on centuries old um, uh, scientific cruises, you know, like the HMS Challenger, for example. So, I mean, there's something that we can do there to, to help 
uh, quantify and, and correct some of those. Um, yeah, so we went along and um, the good ship pressure drop and I should give a shout out to Cassie Bongiovanni, who was our chief um, surveyor. Um, she led all of the, all of the mapping effort um, and we're working on, on interpreting that and getting all that published now. But um, it's worth noting that where the DES study thought that the deepest point of the Java Trench is over in this box D, but actually it turned out to be just in this little area in box C, where this large seamount is being subducted into the trench axis. And that's just created this, this isolated deep. And that's where we, we put Victor and we put him down to 7,187 metres. As the five deeps progressed, actually, um, the, the science was growing in importance within the, the five deeps community, which was fantastic. You know, the first couple of um, trenches, you know, the, I mean, the science was in there, don't get me wrong, but I mean, you know, there was a certain amount of, of stress, you know, because it was you know, very much time dependent. You know, we had to get down to the Southern Ocean for a certain weather window and, um, and time just wasn't on our side in terms of doing robust science. But once those two trenches were over, um, and we came into the Indian Ocean and onwards um, for the rest of the, the expedition, the science was growing more and more in importance. And so we had the opportunity for the first dedicated science dive in the Java Trench. Um, and I'll, I'll show some images from that too. But um, just to highlight, I mean, Java Trench is one of my favourite trenches. And, um, and just to sort of look, the, the mapping and the resolution of the mapping is just fantastic. And what we can see here in this little example is just we see these large seamounts coming into the trench axis and just it's as this plate here is being bent to go get forced underneath the plate to the north these faults are happening so these are bend related faults so that the plate is just breaking as it's being thrust underneath the the plate to the north and it's creating these large scars on the seabed they look like scars and these are massive escarpments and they're hundreds of meters high so there's near vertical sort of cliffs if you will but they're not related to a beach or an, uh, an ocean uh, sort of edge um there's a they're huge huge escarpments and they're just all over these subducting seamounts and over the the sort of wider play area but even better when you get your eye and you start to see all these little cauliflowers all these little cauliflower features on the edge of this overriding plate and these are the are the scars from submarine landslides and these are not small features these are tens of kilometers across and the volume that we're talking about in terms of the rocks and things that they're they're looking at is is huge um so I mean, these are these are really important for for science for our research to to map them and to to look at the volume of them, and um, and that's what we're working on just now. We're doing a lot of um, research on that just now, because the importance of these is that some of these have the potential to have caused tsunamis in the geological past. So it's important to sort of look at these and see what lessons that we can learn for the future going forward. And just another little um, close up. This is one of the seamounts coming into the trench axis. And even those seamounts, the edges of them, have got these little submarine landslide scars. And so we're busy mapping these. And the sort of slightly jerky fly through in the bottom right there, that's just, I can't sort of drill home enough. And it really gets me excited when I think about the, the different topography that you're getting in all of these trenches. These trenches are incredibly variable and they're just really exciting areas to be working in and, and undertaking research and exploring. And these are some photos. The bottom two here are from the scientific landers, but the rest of them are from the, the submersible. And it was just to sort of give you a flavour for the different types of sea floor that we were encountering using the submersible from sort of relatively soft sea bottoms with them. Um, <laughs> Um, with uh, various uh, holothurians and, and different types of, of uh, biology um, inhabiting the, those areas. But what gets me re really excited are some of these areas of rocky outcrops. And if you can pick out at home the, the bright oranges and yellows and whites there, these are really um, specialised bacterial mats that are feeding off 
well, you might want to call it fortified waters that are that's that's erupting on the seabed. And those bacterial mats are, are chemosynthetic communities, so they're highly specialized, but it's 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 really interesting to see them in these locations. And we saw them in other trenches as well. And um, and so we're looking at, at uh, trying to, to drill down and unpick the story as to why they're found in certain areas and not others. And down in the, in the bottom corner, some of the, the more unusual and, and certainly charismatic biology that we saw, um, that's the, the deepest filmed um, octopus uh, that, was, that we found. And, uh, and I stopped a scurrying that had just sort of drifted past the, the lander. Um, so onwards to the Pacific, and, um, and we'll start off in the, in the Mariana. Um, I won't dwell too long in the Mariana. The Mariana is actually relatively well um, uh, sort of visited by scientists and researchers. There's a lot of academic studies looking at the deepest point on Earth in Challenger Deep. So there's been a lot of studies sort of looking to, to measure it accurately. So it meant that when we went there with the, with the five deeps expedition, we knew exactly where to concentrate our effort. I mean, we did do our own mapping um, to be consistent with the other trenches that we'd visited, but, um, but it was really um, exciting to, to be there. Um, and we measured a depth at Challenger Deep for Victor of 10,924 metres, and Victor did that dive in, in April. And again, we got a number of other dives, including some dedicated science dives um, in the Marianne Trench too, um, which is, is very exciting. But just to sort of highlight, you know, that there was a little bit of uncertainty. Up until the 1960s, the deepest point on Earth was thought to be horizon deep in the Tonga Trench. So it was worth us making the transit down to the Ton Tonga Trench uh, and the Kingdom of Tonga to have a look at horizon deep which was thought to be around about 10,800 metres deep and the second deepest place on Earth. But the data wasn't great, so we wanted to be sure because we didn't want to be in a situation in a couple of years' time where, you know, we realised that, you know, well, actually, there's somewhere deeper, Victor, you're going to have to go and go to a whole other different part of the ocean. So um, we did do the survey and we found a final deep depth of um, 10,816. And again, we've got these beautiful bendulated faults coming down into the trench axis and it looks like a staircase in the data whenever you look at it but that staircase is you know like 900 meters high you know each step is 900 meters high so i mean the the geomorphology and topography of these areas is truly spectacular and awe-inspiring but i mean one of my favorite places that i think we visited um was actually the arctic ocean and the deepest part of that being the malloy hole and this is a picture of us in, in some of the ice pack um, near the Malloy Hole, just north of the Malloy Hole. Uh, Malloy Hole is actually just uh, just west of Svalbard, um, part of part of Norway, northern part of Norway, Norway. And um, the maximum depth is just short of five thousand seven hundred meters. That's what the best data that we had available to us told us. But the weather window was extremely limited, and there was a real worry, you know whenever we were doing the rest of the expedition, we're always looking forward and just going, oh crikey, I hope we managed to get up to Malloy in time, because otherwise the weather window would close and we didn't really want to be in weather conditions like this. This is a photo from um, my colleague, David McEnroy, who was involved in IODP expedition um, PO2 to the, to the central Arctic. And, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, everything is white, you know, our vessel is white, or <laughs> for pressure drop is white, um, the landers are white, the submersible is white, icebergs are white. You know, it wasn't going to be a good day at the office trying to operate in, in sort of waters a bit like this. I mean, it would just be impossible. So there was always a bit of worry um, that, that the weather window was so short in Malloy, it was quite stressful. But we got there and um, we spent a little bit of time afterwards in, in Svalbard. And I know that it looks like I'm just showing my holiday photos but again, it, it's just a spectacular part of the world to, to visit and have the, the ability and the opportunity to visit these areas. Um, truly spectacular. So the, what was special about Malloy is that it was the only site that we were visiting that wasn't a, a subduction trench. And it was the shallowest one by almost half. It's almost half the depth of the Mariana. And, um, but even though it was the shallowest, it was perhaps the one that worried us the most because of this really short weather window. Um, but that, that being said, Lady Luck really shined on us and we ended up with three dives on site. Um, and we'll come, we'll describe that a wee bit later on. 
and we sounded a maximum depth of 5,551 meters and, um, and Victor became the, he actually completed his vision and his aim of becoming the first individual to, to set, well not set foot on, but to visit the deepest parts of the, the world's five oceans was, you know, successfully realized on the 24th of August last year. So um, just really quickly, just to touch on some of the, the, the science coming out of five deeps, you know, I mean, I can't talk more about multidisciplinary research. I mean, a lot of my best projects have been projects that are cross-disciplinary. They involve the engineers, the hydrographers, the biologists, the geologists, the oceanographers. And it's only by pooling those resources and working with these individuals from, you know, a number of different disciplines that I think they can really truly you know, um, excel in your areas. But I mean, looking specifically at the geological research and the research that we're undertaking at the British Geological Survey, we're looking at the C4 pro processes in these deep areas, the geohazards. I, I touched upon the, the submarine landslides that um, we are seeing in these deep um, trenches and the potential impact of those, those features. The geomorphology and the heterogeneity of these deep places. So the geomorphology, I mean, I already described, you know, some of these um, bend related fractures, the basins, the sea mounts, you know, there's a lot going on there in terms of the, the geomorphology and the heterogeneity, so the, the, the various composition and the sorts of seabed bottoms that we're seeing. But I mean, I, I, I mentioned earlier about seabed 2030 and all of our data is going to contribute to that effort, that global mapping effort. And we managed to, just five deeps alone, um, we managed to acquire over sort of 650,000 kilometers square. And just to show what a, what a difference that makes, you know, the, the sort of bland gray areas are areas that are only covered in satellite data. So you get a really broad coarse feeling as to the shape of the seabed, but the multi-beam the, the, the multi is colored where it's five deeps and it's grayscale where it's sourced from other places. So in this case, it's Geoscience Australia. Um, but I mean, look at the level of detail that's there that is missing in these areas of, of satellite altimetry. And if you think back to one of my earlier slides, just showing how many white areas, these blank areas in the map, you know, any sort of concerted effort at mapping, you know, and contributing to the to the to the seabed 2030 is is time well spent um, for, for the greater good. And um, and we covered and we managed to visit a huge number of um, of features on the way. But I mean, just to note that Five Deeps is, is continuing, it's now become the ring of fire. And al although there's been a, a global pandemic, you know, the personnel on the, on the pressure drop have been sort of isolated. And so they, they formed a little sort of bubble of their own. And in the meantime, they have been working hard and they've mapped the Philippines Trench, the full Mariana Trench, the Volcano Trench, Japan, Isobon and Aleutian, you know, the mapping continues and we're over a million um, kilometres square now mapped by the pressure drop. And just to highlight, um, we won a grant from the Darwin Initiative, um, which is funded by DEFRA in the UK, to use the five deeps data from the South Sandwich Trench because that data set lies within one of the largest marine protected areas on the planet. And one of the outcomes of a review of that MPA is that they were missing information from this really deep area of the, the MPA. And that's a gap that we have been able to fill. And so we're busy looking at the geodiversity and biodiversity of the, the South Sandwich Trench and to, to help um, the managers of that MPA make better decisions as to how they implement the MPA. And just really quickly, um, some images of the different types of C4. As I said, it's not just some sort of barren, flat, soupy um, wasteland. You know, we see a huge variety of um, substrates, so the different type of rocks and sediments that we're seeing, and also the morphology, whether that be sort of um, ridges and escarpments on the seafloor, areas of rock outcrop with chemosynthetic, or even in an area of the Mariana Trench, we've found some old vent systems. So I mean, all of these sort of things that are, are interesting science that, that we're publishing at the minute. Um, 
this, uh, these are some figures that I stole from my colleague Alan Jameson down at Newcastle. Um, there were a lot of biological highlights. Obviously, I'm not a biologist, so I won't dwell too much on them. But I mean, you know, there's been a lot of new species discovered and there's a lot of research going into looking at um, endemism between sort of some of these communities. So how, how unique each community is becoming just because it's geographically isolated from the next one. I don't want to dwell too much on the negative um, because I think that all exploration, you're going to find, you know, some absolutely amazing um, features and things, you know, but we did find quite a bit of trash and the impact of, of humans is felt in some of these deep places of our world. And the bottom three pictures there are images from Challenger Deep and those are um, umbilicals that have been discarded by, um, by some submersible, uh, submersible vehicles. So um, just quickly for the last minute, I did something a little bit exciting last year um, and I haven't really told too many people about it, but uh, through the five deeps, and I'm incredibly grateful, um, I had the amazing opportunity to do a submersible dive to about 2,500 metres on the Malloy Seamount. And, um, and when you do a dive, you get a lovely uh, flame retardant boiler suit, um, one size fits nobody. Um, and of course, you're all wired up for, for mics and sound. There's video cameras inside the, the, the submersible to record your reactions. Speaking about the, um, the, the TV crew that were there, you know, before you board the submersible, you've got to sort of talk about how you're feeling and how excited you are and, um, and what you're expecting to find down there. Um, are you scared? I wasn't at all. I really, I, people have asked me this, I was not scared. But um, and then, of course, you know, you, you sort of start to climb into the, uh, the submersible. This is Tim McDonald from uh, Triton, uh, sub, uh, Triton Submarines, one of the engineers. And he's responsible for, for uh, readying the submersible for, um, for dive. So securing it all, sealing the hatches, stowing the, the, the strops and things, you know. So um, he's there to help you get safely into the submersible. But you've got to stop for your photo opportunity before you, you get in. Um, and that's it. So Tim's doing his thing, making everything safe pre-dive. Um, so I'm inside that submersible bobbing around. It's surprisingly comfortable. Um, there's not too much space inside the sphere for the two people, but it's all perfectly kitted out. And, um, and whenever you're bobbing on the top, you don't start to feel sick or anything. It's all, it's all good. But I cannot talk enough about the moment where, you know, my pilot, Victor, is um, he's reading the sonar. And he's saying, all right, bottom's coming up, 100 metres to bottom, 50 metres to bottom. And the moment where the sea floor looms out of the darkness is just one of the best moments of my career. It was absolutely fantastic. And it just got better. I was on a seamount. There are known areas of um, high biodiversity, so there were a lot of fish around. Um, I did a transect from about 2,500 metres to, I think, about... 2,000 metres water depth up a section of the flank and I mean it was just covered in crinoids, little, little feather stars, um, uh, sponges, there were little sort of uh, nephro, uh, well I wouldn't say nephrops, they probably weren't, but little sort of um, crustaceans and things but I mean it was just fantastic and having that experience and the ability as a scientist to put my eyes on the ground and to discuss with Victor as pilot, you know, where is interesting to go? Can we hover here while I get a better look at this? I think with what I'm seeing here, you know, we need to go 200 meters over in this direction. I mean, the ability to do that, which you cannot get with, you know, any other type of, of, um, of equipment at the moment, you know, it, it was just fantastic. And, you know, I, I'm quite a happy, smiley person anyway, but I think, you know, I didn't stop smiling the entire time. And, um, and another highlight is that, uh, of course, you've got the world's most extensive Uber taxi coming to pick you up and using the, the external video cameras, you can actually see pressure drop um, coming over the horizon while you're bobbing on the sea surface waiting to get picked up. Um, you can actually see them coming to get you. And that is just, yeah, brilliant, fantastic. So um, another big, uh, big smiley picture of me some concluding thoughts. The deepest places on earth are not out of sight, out of mind. Um, we do have an impact and we do have a responsibility to, to sort of see what's down there and, and to, to make better decisions about what we're doing. Um, and, you know, pressure job shows that 
you know, new technologies are there and, you know, we've got the ability to study these ultra deep areas, you know, we shouldn't just sort of brush them under the carpet as areas that we can't get to, be difficult. I spoke already about, you know, embracing multidisciplinary research and, you know, that's, you know, that's something that I think all, if you're considering getting into ocean sciences, whether it's geology or oceanography and stuff, you know, embracing that early on is, is key, I think, to your career. And then um, sort of thinking about anybody who's considering a, a career in sort of marine sciences, you know, advice I would give to you is that, you know, have the conversations with, you know, people that you see giving a good presentation or email them if you read a really good paper of theirs, you know, have the conversation because in my experience, and it's certainly true of Five Deeps, I only got involved in Five Deeps because I had a coffee with Alan Jameson um, some years ago and we were chatting about things that were coming on the horizon and things that we're interested in. So have the conversation and best of all, have fun in what you do as you, in whatever career you decide to choose. So um, thanks very much. Um, I'm a huge host of people made um, my experience of the Five Deeps and my involvement in the Five Deeps possible. And thanks to all the, the people who provided me photos to use in this. And um, thanks very much. So, Hopefully I've left enough time for some questions. Thanks very much. Hi Heather, thank you for that fantastic talk. Um, we have got one question in through the chat so far. Um, so do you want to read that out to you? So our first question is, um, what, what are the main areas that firstly scientists would look at um, what scientists are interested in these depths initially? And what scientists are interested in these depths? Oh gosh, um, well, all. <laughs> I think as soon as you sort of say to any scientist, you know, oh, I've got some data from somewhere that hasn't been visited before or we know very little about, regardless, you're going to start getting interested. Um, geologists are interested because they're looking at, um, at different types of crust. There's still quite a lot of work going on at looking at aging some of the crust. Um, I think some of the structures that we're seeing, um, so that what's giving the, the seafloor its shape are interesting. So there's a lot of people um, looking at that, myself included. Um, oceanographers are looking at currents in these deep trenches. Um, biologists are you know, hugely excited about the, the samples that you can acquire in these deep trenches and certainly you know Alan has a an international team working up the, the samples and collaborating on those samples from the, the five deeps. So I think as soon as you say I've got data from somewhere that nobody's really been before, everybody's wanting in. You know, it, it's very exciting. That's fab. We've got a few more questions coming in. Um, so what are the factors behind a submarine landslide? So submarine landslides, they can be caused by a number of things. So some of them are just gravity. So like whenever you're driving through the highlands of Scotland, for example, you can be driving along the road in a valley and you can see on the, the slopes of the valley on either side of your car, you know, little landslips and those are just gravity. So if you've got unconsolidated, so reasonably loose material on a slope, at some point, you know, you gather enough of it, it's going to start to move. And so that can be a trigger. So gravity. Earthquakes are an obvious um, trigger. And certainly with somewhere like the Java Trench, we know through, you know, there, there have been a number of, of well covered and documented um, tsunamis, you know, with huge impacts on, on uh, communities across the, the Indian Ocean. Um, so earthquakes are, are a known huge trigger to, um, to submarine landslides. But I mean, that being said, you know, looking at Java Chens in particular, you know, we need to do an awful lot more work to sort of really narrow down and drill down into exactly what's causing these, uh, these submarine landslides. How important are they? You know, when did they occur? And, um, and I think only by sort of doing that and starting to build up a picture, then we can start to maybe, you know, interact with the wider community and and start to, to give information back you know are there areas that perhaps shouldn't be developed along the indonesian coast for example that's really good thanks heather and um, we've got quite a few more coming in so um did the 
camera crew deliver a documentary that we can watch? Uh, the, <laughs> um, my understanding is that the documentary is complete. Um, it, I think it's five episodes um, and it's just waiting on a broadcast date and it will be aired on the Discovery Channel and I'm sure that once we know that broadcast date, it'll be all over social media um, and the like. That's great. So we've got another one. Um, where were the weights that were used, just and um, bi biodegradable? How did the expeditions manage any potential impact on these environments while making sure they gained good scientific results? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, and my engineering colleagues would know a damn sight more about this than I do, but. Um, the the weights that we use, I mean, they're they are metal, but they do rust, and in you know not too long a time, you know, of course it's a some salty environment, they will simply rust, and the impact of those weights being on the seafloor is negligible. Of greater concern are some of the the other things that we are seeing. So it's not us, and um, because that's the only imprint that we are leaving. We're only leaving a few ballast weights at our sites. So our environmental impact is very low and in terms of, of you know, that stuff will rust and disappear. Um, some of the other impacts that we're seeing left by other people, um, that's, that's a bigger concern, I think. And that's something that we're only getting to grips with as we're analysing the, the video data just to see how widespread some of these other anthropogenic, so human left um, things are. Um, we've got another question that's just come in that I think is fantastic. How do you go back to normal work after such an amazing expedition? <laughs> that is a fantastic question. Wow. Um, crikey. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think you, you've caught me there. Um, I think I'm, I realise that I'm incredibly lucky in not just the five deeps, but all of the projects um, that I've been involved in in over my career um, whether they're based more domestically or internationally and looking at you know I've been involved in a number of projects and um, looking at uh, deep sea trenches now I think I'm just I'm interested in everything <laughs> um, and that can be difficult then to sort of prioritize well I'm interested in all of these things how am I going to prioritize which one I'm looking at in terms of Personally, gosh, I suppose if I'm honest, there are a couple of days when you get back from a trip like that, that, you know, you need to decompress a little bit, get used to normal life, um, get used to not having a TV camera in your face all the time. But um, yeah, I, I'm very lucky. I find everything interesting. So I don't necessarily put any more weight to the deep sea trench stuff than I do to the the stuff that I do around about Scotland and uh, and the rest of the UK, for example, because I, I do a lot of work looking at the at the seafloor and the near seabed of, of, the, of the UK continental shelf as well. It's all interesting. That's fab. Um, I've got a couple more. Um, have there been any major seafloor discoveries in the last 20 years which contradict early mapping by, for example, the, the Mary Tharp? Um, for example, the what, sorry? Mary Tharp. Oh, Mary Tharp. No, um, that's the oh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, contradict. Um, no, I think we have to remember that a lot of what has gone before, they've been snapshots in time. So they've been based on the best available data at that time. And I view a lot of our work that we're not contradicting or trying to get one up on, on these previous studies, you know, expect, I mean, you can't get over just how groundbreaking some of those early maps done by, you know, Hazine and Tharp were. I mean, they really did rewrite the book on, on what we thought was going on with, with global processes. And I don't think that we can detract from that. All we can do is add to the story and sort of, you know, discuss, well, this is what we did know, you know, and we take on board those lessons and we move forward with what we now know. And you know, and, and we're adding to that body of knowledge every step of the way. So I'd like to think that we don't sort of contradict or, you know, pick fights. You know, I think, I think we're more sort of uh, friendly and more team players than that. You know, we're, we're adding to the body of knowledge and, um, and there's a lot to be discovered out there. That's fab. Have you got a bit more time for a few more questions? Uh, yes, yes, not a problem. 
So how was the expedition funded? Yeah, I, I stated that at the, at, the, at the start that this entire expedition was, was conceived and financed by Victor Vescovo. Um, so it was entirely his own, um, his own finances that have, have put this on. So, yep. Um, is the documentary film out? When will it be out? I think we've covered this one. Hopefully soon. It is ready to broadcast. We're just waiting for me on a broadcast date. Do we have an understanding what controls the deepest part of the trenches? Is it related to dominant subduction strategies? Yeah, so um, the distribution, like where exactly that you'd find that, you know, that really deep little spot um, is variable. So a lot of it is controlled by the topography, so the shape of the sea surface of that incoming plate. So the plate that is going to get sort of taken in and thrust underneath the overriding plate. So a lot of it is dominated by the topography of that. So if you're starting to get sort of sea mounts and, and ridges, ancient red ridges, um, sort of coming in and and being sort of taken down into the trench axis and consumed um, by the subduction zone. So that's what controls where the the um, the deep point is. I suppose that, you know maybe what the the questioner is looking for is that it's not predictable. You know you couldn't just take a trench and go yep it'll be there. You really do have to map because you need to understand what the shape of the the sea floor is and understand the impact of things like these bend related faults. Sort of as these, these faults are, are put in place and, and activated, they're creating little basins themselves in between them, so these little grab-ins as well. That's great, thank you. Um, another one is, could you see a difference in any places that had been surveyed well in the past? And how well are the subduction rates known? Okay, um, yeah, take the, the subduction rates. Um, there's a lot of studies um, looking at um, subduction rates and they employ a lot of physics and mathematics that is beyond me, if I'm honest. Um, so I think a lot of the subduction rates are, are reasonably well constrained in some areas, not in all, because some of the more remote trenches, for example, you know, South Sandwich and Tonga and stuff, you know, there's maybe just not the data available that they can look um, at the subduction rates. Um, looking at uh, differences between old and, and new data, I mean, as I said, some of these areas, they're only covered by this really generalized um, data set derived from satellite um, data, and which is great where you don't have any information. You know, if you don't have anything, you need to fill in the gap of something. I mean, that's not to detract from that, but if you want to look at detail, it isn't up to the job. And the differences, I mean, I, I showed that with the, the last slide there, looking at the Diamantina fracture zone, you can see the, the sort of really general sort of you know, grayscale patches, which was a, in a huge contrast to the ridges and the deeps and the, the faults that we were seeing within the Diamantina fracture zone itself. So, I mean, that, that contrast um, is, is really marked whenever you look at, you know, what was known before, what's known now. That's really good, thank you. I think we're on our last couple of questions now on the Q&A. Um, so which one of those five points would you go back to for, back to for future geological examination? And if you, if you would, given the chance to go back, um, are there any further scientific explorations planned in the future? And the last question, do you need an assistant? <laughs> I always need an assistant. I've got, uh, I've got too much work to do. Um, it's, all, it's all exciting. Um, okay, which one would I go back to? Gosh, all of them. Um, oh, uh, South Sandwich has really got my, my attention at the minute. I think um, the data set that we've got there is, is just giving, but I mean, oh gosh, Java, Tonga. Tonga and its, um, its sort of southern ex extension of, um, and there's another trench to the south called the Kermadec Trench and they're separated by a, a massive seamount. Um, that system is very good. Oh gosh, yeah. Oh, and lots of other trenches that we haven't even been to yet. You know, the Philippines would be fantastic. Oh gosh, I can't choose. It's like choosing between your children. Um, and uh, yeah, I think <laughs> I think I've lost track of the, the question now. Yeah, I think I would go to them all if I really had to pick one. Really, Tonga. That's hard. And um, and yes, I'm always looking for an assistant. 
Um, Ethica, I think we're on our last one now. So will you be collaborating with Victor on any future endeavours? Yes, so um, what's really exciting is that um, Five Deeps has, has morphed into its, its next phase, which is called Ring of Fire. And, um, and unfortunately, as I said, the, the global pandemic, you know, we were meant to be on board the boat doing lots of, of, sort of scientific lander deployments and stuff. But, um, but that's, that's kind of been knocked in the head for, for very good reasons. But that being said, the ship has still been there and, you know, Victor has had it out working hard and doing a lot more mapping. Um, and now all that data is sort of sitting ready to, we call it ground truthing. So you, you have your, your sort of um, your map of what the, the topography is and, and what you're looking at, but you want to pick sites based on that um, to, to explore in more detail, either using the landers or the sub or maybe um, get involved in other um, international efforts like the International Ocean Discovery Programme and going in and sampling um, with, uh, with other equipment. There's a lot of options and um, and Five Deeps is far from over. It's it's just called something else now. And um, and the the work is continuing and it's it's an exciting time to be a, a geologist or a marine researcher in general. Oh fantastic. Thank you, Heather. I think that's all the questions that we've got for now. Um, so that was really great. Thank you very much. Okay, well, um, thanks very much everyone for, for listening um, during our lunch break. And uh, yeah, please tune in for the rest of the week because we've got a number of other lectures um, being given by some of the some of our uh, GS geologists and researchers. I'll certainly be tuning in. Thanks very much.